thank you for joining me for my chapter 11 final lecture to finish it out for intermediate accounting. We are going to cover goodwill in the beginning of this lecture. As you may remember, goodwill is when a company purchases another company and they have paid an extra amount for that above what the actual value of their assets are. So typically that goodwill would be paying for the trained employees or for the good reputation of the company or something like that. So um, goodwill is what you've paid above and beyond when you purchase another company, above and beyond what their net assets are worth. So goodwill has an indefinite life. It's an intangible asset with an indefinite life. So we do not amortize goodwill. However, we do test it for impairment annually and also any other time that you think that there is a circumstance that has taken place that could have caused impairment to that intangible asset. So a company has the option of first undertaking a qualitative assessment to avoid the quantitative test. So for goodwill, you can measure impairment loss with just a one-step process. If the book value exceeds the fair value, then an impairment loss is recognized for the difference. So you don't have to do the recoverability test for goodwill. If an impairment loss is recognized, the written down book value becomes the new cost base for the future cost allocation. So if you allocate the cost at all, it's gonna be the new value that you've written it down to. All right, so unlike other assets, when it comes to goodwill, its cost cannot be directly associated with any specific identifiable right, and it is not separable from the company as a whole. So remember, there's not anything physical that goodwill is, and you're really just recognizing that you paid an additional amount for something intangible that your company saw as valuable in another company when they purchased it. So it can't be directly associated with a specific patent or a specific trade name or copyright. So it's very hard to determine how much goodwill is worth and if an impairment has taken place. An impairment of goodwill can't be measured in the same way as these other long-lived assets for that reason. <clears throat> so the level of testing is the reporting unit. Okay, so a reporting unit is an operating segment of a company for which the discrete financial information is available and segment management regularly reviews the operating results of that component. So what that means is you have a separate company with separate financial information that is has separate reporting financial information. That's a reporting unit. So you can sometimes determine if that reporting unit is not doing as well if there is an impairment for that specific unit. And that's the best way to tell if the fair value is less. So our two-step process for measuring goodwill is first, a goodwill impairment loss is indicated when the fair value of that reporting unit is less than its book value, less than the amount we have on the balance sheet for goodwill. Then step two, if, it, if that does happen, where you see the fair value is less than the book value, you move to step two, <clears throat> and a goodwill impairment loss is measured with the excess of book value over its implied fair value. So it's a little simpler to account for the goodwill impairment loss once you figure out how much the difference is between book value and fair value. You don't have to look at the undiscounted cash flow in step one and then the discounted in step two. Here we just use the fair value that we have determined or that someone, uh, an outside professional has determined to be the fair value of that reporting unit. That's gonna have to be the difference that you report as the impairment loss, the difference between the fair value and its book value. So let's look at an example. In 2017, the Upchain Corporation acquired Pharmacopia Corporation for $500 million. 
of Jane recorded $100 million in goodwill related to this acquisition because the fair value of net assets of Pharmacopoeia was $400 million. Okay, so remember the difference between the net value of the assets, which was $400 million in this case, and the amount that the company actually paid to purchase the other company is going to be goodwill. So there was a hundred million dollar difference. So Upjane believed that Pharmacopoeia had a hundred million dollars worth of maybe reputation, trained employees, um, whatever it may have been. For some reason, they said this company is more valuable than their actual net assets. So they have a hundred million dollars in goodwill recorded on the balance sheet. After the acquisition, Pharmacopoeia continues to operate as a separate company and is considered a reporting unit. Okay, so Upjane now owns Pharmacopoeia, but they are still doing separate financials. It's still a separate company. It's just now owned by Upjane. So that's what we're talking about when we say reporting unit. At the end of 2018, events and circumstances indicated that it is more likely than not that the fair value of Pharmacopoeia is less than its book value, requiring Upjane to perform step one of the goodwill impairment test. So something has happened, some kind of event, some kind of circumstance that says, hey, we don't think Pharmacopoeia is worth as much as we have it on the books for. The book value of Pharmacopoeia's net assets at the end of 2018 is 440 million, including the 100 million in goodwill. On, the, on that date, the fair value of Pharmacopoeia is estimated to be 360 million, and its fair value of its in unidentified of its identified tangible and intangible assets, excluding goodwill is estimated to be $335 million. So we definitely see that there was an impairment. The fair value is much less than what we have it as our book value, which is now $440 million. So we do our step one test. We say that the $440 million book value is higher than the fair value of the reporting unit of $360 million. So it's clear there is an impairment loss. So we need to figure out exactly how much of an impairment loss there is. So we take the book value of goodwill, which we know was $100 million. We got that from the top there in the, the first part of this problem. And then the implied fair value of goodwill is now $25 million. The way that we got that implied fair value is that it told us the fair value of Pharmacopoeia is estimated to be 360 million. The fair value of all identifiable assets, excluding goodwill, is 335 million. So the difference between those two amounts is one of them includes goodwill, one of them does not. So the difference between 360 million and 335 million is the 25 million implied fair value of goodwill. So we have goodwill on the books at 100 million. The implied fair value is only 25 million, so that means our impairment loss would be $75 million. So this is what the journal entry would look like to record this impairment loss. We're gonna debit loss on impairment of goodwill for $75 million. And then we're gonna decrease our intangible asset of goodwill with a credit of $75 million as well because goodwill is an asset, it's a normal debit balance on the balance sheet. When we credit goodwill, we're gonna decrease it by the 75 million. That means goodwill will now be sitting on our balance sheet at 25 million. Let's do a little concept check for goodwill when we have an impair impairment. In 2017, Mochan Inc. acquired Sanchez Company and recorded goodwill of $290 million as a result. The net assets, including goodwill from Mochan's acquisition of Sanchez, had a 2018 year-end book value of $1,160,000. Or $1,160 million, sorry. 
Mo Chan assessed the fair value of Sanchez at this date to be 1 million or 1,020 million. So in other words, 1 billion, 20 million. While the fair value of all of Sanchez and Sanchez's identifiable, tangible and intangible assets, excluding goodwill was 90 million. The amount of impairment loss that they should record for goodwill at the end of 2018 is how much. So what we're gonna do here is we are gonna take the, well, first we're gonna figure out how much we think goodwill's fair value is at this point. So we saw that goodwill was, the difference is, let's see, 1 billion, 20 million, minus the 900 million when we exclude goodwill. So it tells us our fair value is 1 billion, 20 million. That's including goodwill. But then for all of our identifiable, tangible and intangible assets, excluding goodwill, it's 900 million. So the difference between the two has to be the amount of goodwill, because that's the only thing that's not included in the 900 million that was included in the 1 billion, 20 million. So the difference is 120 million. So that means the 120 million is what our implied fair value is for the purchase of Sanchez company. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our recorded goodwill, it tells us right in the beginning of 290 million, we're going to subtract out the 20 million, the 120 million of implied fair value of goodwill. And we see the difference is 170 million. That was our impairment loss. That's the difference between the amount we had on the balance sheet for goodwill that we initially recorded and the amount of our implied fair value. That difference is going to be the loss, which would result in our new goodwill being 120 million on the balance sheet. And just to reiterate how we got that 120 million, we took the 1 billion 20 million that says it was the fair value of Sanchez. And then we subtracted out the fair value of all of Sanchez Sanchez's identifiable assets excluding goodwill. So the only thing this 900 million does not have in it that the 1 billion 20 million did have in it was goodwill. So the difference between the two must be how much the implied fair value is of goodwill. So that answer would be 120 million. That's how much we should show on the balance sheet for goodwill, but we were showing 290. So we need to recognize a loss, an impairment loss of goodwill of 170 million. All right, we're gonna move on to the next thing here. Always let me know if you have questions about what we have already covered. And always feel free to look back at those videos and see if you can catch it if you rewatch it. <clears throat> okay, so assets to be sold. When we talk about assets to be sold, they're assets that management has actively committed to immediately sell in their present condition and for which sell is probable. We talked about all of the criteria to have an asset held for sell. And so this is just kind of summing that up, the assets to be sold. If the book value exceeds the fair value, less the cost to sell, an impairment loss is recognized for the difference. Okay, so we, if we find out that our fair value minus any cost that we would incur to sell that asset is um, less than the book value we have these assets to be sold recorded at, then we have to recognize an impairment loss for the difference between those two. These assets are not depreciated or amortized. If they're being held for sale, we are not depreciating them. We are not amortizing them. We are expecting to sell them instead. They're reported separately in the balance sheet. Okay, so if you're holding an asset to sell, it's not listed with the other assets. It's gonna be on a separate section. Expenditures subsequent to acquisition. 
Okay, so this is a separate thing here. So if you have um, a long lived asset that is that requires you to have other expenditures, you're repairing that asset, you're maintaining it, or you're improving it after you've purchased the asset, this is how we're going to account for that. Okay, so expenditures that produce benefits beyond this current fiscal year are going to be capitalized. Expenditures that maintain a given level of benefits are expensed in the period they are incurred. So in other words, if you have an asset that you had to do routine maintenance on and it's not anything um, that you're adding to the asset, making it better, making it to where it's going to bring in more revenue, and it's just to get you through this time, then you're just going to expense it. If it's just a repair um, or maintenance, you're just going to expense it in the current period. But if it's something that is going to produce benefits in the future past this year, then you would be capitalizing that asset. So capitalizing is we are increasing the asset's book value or we are creating a new asset versus if we're just maintaining the given level of benefits that that asset is already bringing in, then we're going to expense it. So if your machine breaks down and you have to repair it, that's just going to be an immediate expense. But if we're actually adding to the asset to where it's going to increase the book value, then we would capitalize it or to where it creates a whole new asset, then we would capitalize it. Capitalizing meaning it would go as an asset on the balance sheet. All right, so future benefits. What are we talking about when we say future benefits? We're talking about capitalizing. What is a future benefit? One, it is an extension of its useful life of the asset. So we thought it was gonna last for five years, but because we um, made this expenditure, it's actually gonna give the asset a longer life, or maybe it increases the operating efficiency that would result in an increase of the quantity of goods or services produced, or it could decrease the future operating cost. So this was not just routine maintenance. We actually made an expenditure that is going to make this asset more efficient by either um, producing more, more quality or more quantity um, of the good or service, or it's going to be a reduce a reduction in future cost because of this upgrade we did. That's something that would result in future benefits, not just routine maintenance. An increase in the quality of goods or services produced is also a future benefit. So if we, we add on to an asset, we have an expenditure of a, an asset that we had acquired in the past, that um, it's now going to create a higher quality, which hopefully means we can charge more for this product or service, then that's also going to bring us in future benefit. Now we do have to remember materiality thresholds. So what does that mean? Materiality means, is it a significant amount that's worth capitalizing? A lot of companies set a materiality threshold for capitalization of any expenditure. So what that means is they've set a limit and say anything that's less than $100, we're just gonna expense. Even if it does help prolong the life a little bit, or even if it will give us benefit more than a year, if it's under $100, it's not worth it for us to capitalize it and um, depreciate it or amortize it over several years. We're just going to expense anything under that $100 or whatever the company sets. And that's fine for a company to do. I thought this was a cute little meme saying, you know, if it's a small expense, it's not worth it. It's not worth capitalizing it. So we'll just expense it in that period and be done with it. All right, so when we say repairs and maintenance, what are we talking about? What are those items that we would be expensing in the period that it is incurred? So repairs and maintenance are going to maintain a given level of benefits provided by the asset. It's not increasing the level of benefits, it's just keeping it where it's at. It's just allowing that machine or whatever it may be to function in the same way that it has been in the past. 
it does not increase the future benefits. And the future benefits are not provided beyond those that were originally anticipated. So we're just keeping things the same with these repairs and maintenance. And in, for any expenses like that, any expenditures like that, we are just going to expense in the period that we incurred that expenditure. <clears throat> All right, what about additions? What if we add on a major component to an existing asset? Well, that should be capitalized because future benefits will be increased. So an example of that is adding um, a refrigeration unit to a delivery truck. It increases the capability of the truck, so it increases the future benefits. So we have this delivery truck, and we said, you know, if we add a refrigeration unit, then we can bring in more revenue because we'll be able to deliver cold items as well. So we would capitalize, we would add that to our assets because it is going to increase the future benefits of that delivery truck. So we would capitalize costs that are necessary expenditures required to bring that addition to a condition and location for use. So this is just the same rules as our acquisition um, cost that we put into assets before. Whatever cost we incur with that refrigeration unit, sales tax, delivery, um, installation, all of that will be capitalized. All of that will be considered an asset um, wrapped up into the cost of this refrigeration unit because any cost that is reasonable and necessary to get your asset into working order can be wrapped up in that cost that you put on the balance sheet and not expensed. <clears throat> What about if we're talking about improvements? So improvements involve the replacement of a major component of an asset. So when we say replacement, it can be a new component with the same characteristics of the old component. So maybe we had an air conditioning unit that went bad and we're gonna put a brand new one in to replace it or a new component with enhanced operating capabilities. So maybe it's a hot water heater and we need to replace it anyway, so we're gonna replace it with a tankless hot water heater. In either of those cases, the cost of improvement usually increases our future benefits. So that means they should be capitalized by increasing the book value of the related assets and depreciated over the useful life of the improved asset. So if we were talking about putting in a new tankless water heater, we would wrap that into the price of the building. We would capitalize it wrapped into the book value of the building that we're putting it in. If we swapped out our refrigeration unit in our delivery truck, we would um, wrap up that cost in the delivery truck. It would not be a separate thing. We've improved the delivery truck. We haven't just put something new in there, um, but we've replaced something the same or better. So it's an improvement. So we're going to increase the book value of the related asset, the delivery truck or the building or whatever it may be. All right, we have three methods to record the cost of the improvements. So we have substitution. This is when we dispose of the old component and we acquire a new, new component. So that is substituting the components. Um, we would capitalize the new cost. The cost of the improvement is included as a debit to the related asset account. Just like I said, if you have um, put in a new unit, you're not gonna create a new asset for it. You're gonna increase the book value of the building or delivery truck or whatever that asset is improving. And the original cost and accumulated depreciation of the original component are not removed. So we keep all of that cost of the original one on the books. We've just improved, we've substituted um, a part of that asset. The reduction of accumulated depreciation, that's our um, another method. We have an asset account 
that is left unaltered, but its related accumulated appreciation is decreased. So this is a, another method we could use. We would actually decrease the accumulated appreciation that we've already recognized when we make this improvement. Um, and then the book value would stay the same as in capitalization cost method, but the cost of the accumulated appreciation amounts differ under these two methods. So if we do the capitalization, we are going to add to add the cost of the improvement to the capitalized item, but in the reduction of accumulated depreciation, instead we're reducing accumulated depreciation. We're not adding to the asset. So in the end, we would have the same book value, but accumulated depreciation would be different in the two methods. Let me know if you have questions about that. I know that's a confusing concept there. All right, let's look at an example. The Palmer Corporation replaced the air conditioning system in one of its office buildings that it leases to tenants. So just like I was talking about air conditioning. The cost of the old air conditioning system was $200,000. And that was included in the cost of the building. However, the company has separately depreciated the air conditioning system. Depreciation recorded up to date of the replacement totaled $160,000. The old system was removed and the new system replaced or installed at a cost of $230,000, which was paid in cash. Parts from the old system were sold for $12,000. All right, let's see what they want from us here. What would our journal entry look like for this situation? Okay, so we brought in cash of $12,000 for the old unit. So we would debit our asset of cash to increase it. We had um, $160,000 in accumulated depreciation for this, for this air conditioning unit. So we're doing the substitution method. So we're gonna take that full $160,000 out of accumulated depreciation, which is normal, like normally a credit balance. So we're gonna debit accumulated depreciation for that amount for the air conditioning units for the 160,000. And then we know that the old unit was 200,000. So we're going to take the old air conditioning amount of 200,000 out of buildings with a credit to buildings for the 200,000. The difference between the debits and credits is 28,000. Well, that difference, since it's a debit, is going to be a loss because normally any kind of income is a credit balance. We know that this needs to be a $28,000 debit, so that's going to be a loss on disposal of the asset. So basically, we had paid 200,000 for it. We had depreciate 160,000, so we had a $40,000 book value. Then we made 12,000. We sold the system for 12,000. So we had 200,000 minus the 60,000 of accumulated depreciation that gave us 40,000. Then since we got cash of 12,000, we'll subtract that from the 40,000 and that gives us $28,000 loss because we had $28,000 in book value that we did not receive back in cash. And then we are going to just debit our buildings for the new unit for 230,000 and credit cash that we spent out. So we did these two entries for the substitution method where we took the old asset off in one entry and we put the new asset on in the other entry. So that's how you would do the substitution method. All right, what if we want to do the capitalization of new cost? So this is the same scenario, but we are going to take the 230,000 for the new unit minus the money we made, the 12,000 for the old unit, that would give us 218,000. When we capitalize the new cost, we do not take the old asset off, but we also do not take the accumulated depreciation off. So all we're gonna do is we are going to debit buildings for the 218,000, the difference between the cost of the new system minus the $12,000 we received in cash. 
and then we are going to credit cash for the amount, the net amount that left us. So in this method, our buildings stayed the same um, book value plus the 218,000 in cash that we had to disperse, but we kept the accumulated depreciation on the books so it will still go against this air conditioning unit. That's the method of capitalization of a new cost. And then the third method is the reduction of accumulated depreciation. So in this situation, instead of adding to the building for the 218,000, we are instead going to decrease how much we have in accumulated depreciation for the buildings. Since accumulated depreciation is a normal credit balance, we debit accumulated depreciation for the 218,000 of net cash that left for this new unit, and then we credit cash. So in the end, we're gonna have the same book value for these buildings. However, we have a different amount in accumulated depreciation that's bringing us to that book value. So hopefully that helps you understand those three methods a little bit better, but please let me know if you have questions. All right, a couple more things to cover here. What if we have rearrangements? So these are expenditures to restructure an asset. There is no addition, there's no replacement, there's no improvement. We are really just moving an asset from one spot to another. We are relocating it. Um, the reason we do this is we want to create new capability for the asset. It's not necessarily going to extend its useful life, but maybe it's not being used in one area of our factory. And if we moved it over to this other department, we would use that machine. So if we moved it from point A to point B, we would get more use out of it, but there are some costs involved in moving the asset. So those costs could be capitalized, or maybe it's an actual building. Maybe you have a building that because of its current location, it's not getting the, um, the it's not bringing in the revenue. Maybe people are not coming in the door or whatever the case may be. So if you move the location of the building, you will actually have bring in more revenue. Of course, you're not adding to the building, but there is a big expense in moving that building. So that expense could be capitalized for this rearrangement. So if the rearrangement expenditures are material, so again, it's a significant amount and it clearly is going to increase our future benefits, then we can capitalize the cost and then expense it in um, the future period. So in other words, we would depreciate these costs in the future. If rearrangement expenditures are not material or it's uncertain that there will be any future benefits increased, then we would go ahead and expense it in the current period. So in other words, if you're just moving a piece of machinery from one side of the building to the other, and there is very little cost in it, just expense the cost. Or if they have an expense, but an expenditure, but we're not really sure that it is gonna help at all with any future benefits, in that case, it may also be expensed in that same period. Okay, so, we had one example question earlier on in this chapter that touched on this. And hopefully, if you didn't fully understand it, this will help clear it up. Um, cost of defending intangible rights. So we're talking about getting into some legal aspects here. If an intangible right is successfully defended, in other words, you had to go to court maybe to defend that you had the patent on a certain process. Um, if it's successfully depended, in other words, you win that legal battle, the litigation costs should be capitalized and amortized over the remaining life of that related intangible asset. So if it was a patent that you were trying to defend and you successfully defended it, then you would increase the amount of the patent on the balance sheet and amortize that amount over the years, the useful life, um, for all the costs of litigation. If it is unsuccessfully defended, in other words, you lose that, those litigation costs would be expensed as incurred because they provide no future benefits. 
you know, if you were able to successfully defend your patent, then there's going to be benefit in that. But if it was unsuccessful, it has to be expensed because there is no future benefit in that litigation. So the book value of any intangible asset should be reduced to its uh, realizable value. So if you lost that litigation, then let's say it is a patent, it may not be worth nearly as much at this point. So you not only would be expensing your litigation cost, but the book value of the asset, let's say the patent, may be reduced also, and you need to reduce it to its realizable value. All right, that is all I have for you guys for chapter 11. Please reach out with questions. I know there is some challenging material in here, and I hope you have a great rest of your day.